we can lose our perspective of ourselves, and that's where anxiety, which is rooted in what if thinking and worst mm. case scenarios, can get a hold of us as it did with me. There were a number of stressors that I was facing that all converged in a perfect storm that were very painful. And I kept saying, I can get through this, I can manage this, but it got so overwhelming that it about did me in. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello friends. My guest today is both a prophet and a scholar who has spent his life ministering career, helping people learn how to flourish and become lifelong learners. His most recent book, On the Edge of Hope, is a transparent and deeply encouraging account of his own struggle with anxiety and depression and how he overcame it. Here to proclaim the truth that no matter how dark the night, the redeemed soul still sings. Dr. Mark Sharona, it's always an honor to have you on this show. You're a friend, and I thank you for joining me to talk about a very important subject that's affecting so many people, even in the church today. It's great to be with you, Brenda. Well, the book is On the Edge of Hope. I'm holding it here. And uh, I, I have to say that this book has really brought me back to um, a place of some deep soul searching. And, you know, your style of writing is so um, picturesque and it's an easy read, but at the same time, it's a challenging uh, read. You, you talk specifically in uh, one of your chapters about the journey to self-awareness and how that it is, um, self-awareness is, is so important to healing, but the, the journey to self-awareness is really painful for all of us. And you equivocate that to a childhood memory, which I'd love for you to be able to expound on a little bit. Can you talk about how this compares to uh, to where we are with some of our thoughts and, and uh, the journey to self-awareness. Yeah, so when I was a kid, I used to love to play in the snow. I lived, we lived in my grandmother's house on the second floor. My cousins lived below me. So we'd go out in the snow and make snow castles and snowmen and tunnels and you'd forget the time. And if I forgot to put on my leather gloves and I put my mittens on instead, I would not pay attention to the fact that my fingers were freezing and that as a kid, you don't think about frostbite. You just don't. And so I would know that I probably was in trouble by the time I couldn't feel my fingers anymore. And I would, um, get worried and I'd run in the house. And if it was grandma that was at the door at, at the first floor, she'd take me down to the basement. If it was my mom, she would take me upstairs to the, to our kitchen, but they would put my hands under warm water mm -hmm. and I wouldn't feel it at first. But as the blood began to go back into those digits, it would hurt. And they wouldn't let me move my hands because they knew that was a sign of healing. And I use that as an analogy to describe the fact that a lot of times we don't realize how much we numb out our pain and we are so busy occupied with what we think we need to do that we take for granted that our psyche can handle the numbing out of our anxieties, our fears, our worries, our, our afflictive negative thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, that cause and are afflictive negative feelings and moods and how they can, after a while, say, you can't run away from me anymore. Mm. And they have to thaw out. And that thawing out process psychologically um, doesn't always feel great. Mm -hmm. It's painful. I, I remember doing yeah. that as a kid and it, it stings. It hurts. Yeah. So... The, the area of coming to self-realization, self-awareness is often much like that. Yeah. I, Augustine, in one of his poems, says, Lord Jesus, make me to know myself, make me to know you. But he starts with Lord Jesus. So that's God awareness. Make me to know myself, 
self-awareness make me to know you god awareness so self-awareness is and even the early fathers and mothers of the church will all say there is no god awareness apart from Mm self-awareness so and scripture bears this out i mean the mystics bear this out when moses is brought to the burning bush and god finally reveals himself as the god of his father and as well as the god of abraham isaac and jacob Moses hides his face because he's afraid to look at God because in the in the midst of God awareness he has to become totally self-aware God is mirroring back to him what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God and he hides his face because he's a broken man with a lot of unfinished business and yes God is utterly holy but God is utterly loving and so we move from Moses from hiding his face at the beginning of the narrative to talking to God face to face at the end of the narrative. And so there's that journey to total self-awareness where um, progressive healing can take place. The tragedy with Moses is that he didn't get it all sorted out because he still had root issues of anger Mm -hmm. that went back a long way that exploded, um, in relationship to not being ultimately i haven't got time but it's a separate topic but he didn't quite grieve the loss of his sister well and the people didn't give him room to grieve so it wasn't the water he was mad at the scholars tell us it was his inability to have time to process the loss of his sister wow so that really points to how Uh, even we, I mean, Moses was, you know, this incredible figure that so much of the scriptures are, are written about. He's the paradigm prophet. He's the paradigm prophet. And so, you know, who are we to think that we would be any different as human beings when we're dealing with traumas and wounds? Uh, But yet, you hear so often in the church that self-awareness is uh, the opposite of, of where we should be. And I don't think you're talking about being self-absorbed. So can you break that down a little bit, unpack that a little bit for somebody that's listening that might think, well, we're not supposed to be self-aware. Well, I think if we're not self-aware, we're going to be self-absorbed. Mm. So David says, in thy light, we see light. The man born blind is sent to the pool of Siloam. He has never seen what he looks like a day in his life. And when he washes the mud and has two brand new eyeballs, he sees his reflection in the water at the pool he is sent to Siloam to be sent. He was sent there to that mikvah in the back of the high priest's quarters in the temple. And, um, in thy light we see light and so i cannot know others until i know myself and i cannot know god without knowing myself because if i really trust the narrative when god breathes into adam the breath of life and adam opens his eyes the first face he sees is the face of the image of the one whom he bears he sees the image of the pre-incarnate son of God. Mm. And that's his mirror. That's who he is supposed to become like image and likeness. He falls miserably short of that, obviously, but self-absorption is the exact opposite. That's to be enclosed and away. Self-awareness requires being opened up to the light of God because we are not Buddhists that seek to annihilate the self. We are followers of jesus where our true to god self can become everything it was meant to be and the challenge is that when we face stressors in life and we face the kind of challenges we've been facing we can lose our perspective of ourselves, and that's where anxiety which is rooted in what if thinking and worst Mm. case scenarios can get a hold of us as it did with me. There were a number of stressors that I was facing that all converged in a perfect storm that were very painful. And I kept saying, I can get through this, I can manage this, but it got so overwhelming that it about did me in. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And I needed help working it out. And it took me three and a half years to move through that season. Wow. Um, and so the lessons I learned, I trust I learned them well. In some ways, I think I'm still learning them all mm-hmm. these 12 or 14 years later. It took me that long to be willing to write the book because certain traumas take a while to process. And it's not fun going back and revisiting them, even if you've been delivered from them. That is true. There's always that shadow of... I've got to re-experience this. I don't know that I want to. And I had a few hiccups writing the book, but it was okay. I managed. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful book. It's a powerful book. And uh, so this would really, I guess, be the basis for loving others as we love ourselves. Yeah. You know, I am, um, if I think back to prior to the, the, what I call my perfect storm in the book, I say that if I had seen the bus coming, I'd have gotten out of the way. Mm. And I, I, if I did see it coming, I kept ignoring the signals. But I, I honestly, when it culminated at the beginning of the pressure building when I couldn't handle it, it started as a panic attack and then it became a full-blown cycle of anxiety that then because of the anxiety led to sleeplessness, which then led to despair, which then led to depression. And anxiety and depression often travel together. And right now, um, because of everything that happened in the last few years between COVID and all the stuff that was generated psychologically with COVID, a lot of people are struggling with these kinds of issues and feel like there's something wrong with them. But what happens is, is that when you go through those kinds of experiences and you deal with automatic negative thoughts and afflictive feelings and afflictive thoughts. And you don't realize that you are not those feelings. You are not those thoughts that at the core of your being, you can observe. Um, If you don't know how to take a step back, you lose perspective of who you are. So Mm -hmm. your self-awareness takes a beating yeah. And you second guess who you are. It doesn't matter that you've had X amount of years of functioning well. Once you are in that strange place, you end up finding that you start reflecting back and thinking, this must be so long standing. There must be such deep roots of this in my life that this has always been hiding below the surface. And you lose your perspective. And, yeah. um, And then the enemy plays havoc with all of that. So you've got to get your perspective healed and understand how to deal with the cognitive and the reflective side psychologically. And then you have to learn that spiritual warfare isn't all I rebuke you and I bind you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, for our viewers, I mean, I, I want them to understand this was taking place at the the pinnacle of a very successful global ministry that uh, you were maintaining, you were flourishing in on one hand and reaching many people. And yet yeah. you were struggling with something that your declarations uh, and all the scriptures that you tried to throw at it were no longer able to uh, be the answer. And so you really consider this to be really your gift, wouldn't you say? It brought you to a place where you had to acknowledge some things that, and and understand that that the healing process is really a lot more than what we've made it to be. Is that correct? Yes. And I think the healing process is tied to the healing person, not the healing technique. And as Westerners, we love techniques and formulas. And Mm. God brought me to a place where he was delivering me from living by formulas and techniques and stop using the Bible as a technology. Mm. Because the Bible isn't a technology, it's the word of God. It is Christ speaking to us from Genesis to Revelation, the story of himself and his embodying of our totality in our humanness so that we could become partakers of his divine nature. And that journey to becoming human doesn't happen by techniques or by formulas or by three easy steps. Mm -hmm. That happens by following him, even with the embracing of the cross, which is at the center of the Mm -hmm. universe, because from the foundation of the world, the lamb has been slain. 
the mm -hmm. slaughtered lamb created the world and he is going to consummate the world because of his sufferings. And so mm. it's like I had to get to know Jesus all over again as if for the first time. Hmm. Yeah, you, you talk in the book about how that we're not machines. And, and really, that's that's culturally, that's the way we're, we've been driven to think that we can have everything now. We, we like to stay busy. We feel important if we're staying busy. But you also speak to the fact that because of the fall of man, we're fragmented. And uh, in that, uh, you know, uh, the Eagles, you know, I remember the Eagles wrote a song about life in the fast lane. And, you know, we really just kind of give praise to that type of a lifestyle. Everybody likes to project that, oh, I'm so busy, I'm important. But you talk about slowing down to the speed of life and the speed of revelation. And I'd like to just read a quote um, in your book on the chapter about soul and body. You say, I am persuaded that most of us pay little to no attention to our fragmentation. We make excuses for it, presuming that grace glosses over it, ignoring the warnings of our own bodies and running roughshod over many portions of the sacred text to justify our failure and to be brutally and ruthlessly honest with ourselves and with God. We get locked in a vicious cycle, trapped in a treadmill of sorts, running fast but going nowhere, easily distracted, never maturing, never growing up, never showing up, quoting Bible verses as if we've arrived. All the while, we're all assuming ourselves to death. Yeah. That sounds like something I would have said. I didn't realize I said it that way. <laughs> well, you know, as I read that, I thought, oh, God, how easy it is for me to fall into that category of I'm busy, I'm doing important things, I'm sacrificing I mean, Paul and I both have, have, you know, been raised by generations before us that were wired the same way. And, you know, I have to wonder, is God calling us to a place of slowing down and listening and acknowledging? Can you speak to where the church is right now and how it's hurting? And uh, beyond that, uh, you know, people are leaving the church by the droves. They are yeah. disillusioned with leaders and, and leaders are disillusioned with the sheep. And there are pastors who are leaving the church. They're leaving the ministry, not necessarily their faith, but they're leaving the ministry. Uh, how does all this, how has all this mindset affected us and where are we going? Oh gosh, the, everything that can be shaken is being shaken in my estimation in this epoch of history. And we need to be concerned about the younger generations that are disillusioned because of the nature of how we have used the scripture for our own ends instead of loving God and loving our neighbor. Um, when I went through that season, it dawned on me that when anyone would ever come up to me prior to that and ask for prayer for anxiety, I had, I knew enough from my psychology degree and from my work as a pastor and what I would call clinical pastoral counseling that I did to help others that, you know, you, you do the best you can, but I would, I would quote only half completely. Mm. Be not anxious from the lips of Jesus and Paul and not slow down to the speed of the depths of what was being said there. When Jesus goes on to say, consider the lilies of the field, they mm. neither toil nor spin. If I'm out, if I was out on a day trip back then with the kids there, I've got grandkids now, but you know, the lilies, they're pretty. Let's keep on going. There's more important things. <laughs> yeah. So slowing down to the speed of life. When you are anxious, your mind is scattered. And it's scattered by what if thinking and worst scenario thinking. And we think that the harder we fight it, it'll go away. But the harder you fight it, the more power you generate for it to continue. And I had to unlearn a lot of what I thought I was using to help other people 
prior to my season. And today, if someone were to ask me, you know, Bishop, can you pray for my anxiety? I'm going to take a big step back, ask them to talk to me a little bit first about mm. the level of their anxiety on a scale of one to 10. If one is next to nothing and 10 is I feel like I, I'm going to jump out of my skin, mm. I get a sense of where they are. And then I want to know what are the circumstances that they're facing and the stressors they're facing. And then where is the what if thinking? And then find out how difficult it is for them to be with those thoughts without, without allowing those thoughts to define them. Mm -hmm. Now, the average person that doesn't believe in that, if you just quote a Bible verse at it, I, I have little patience for those kind of people mm -hmm. anymore. There, there's mm -hmm. an ignorance there that's deeply disturbing because they really don't know how to read scripture well or faithfully, they use it as a tool, but aren't hearing Christ in it or the heart of Christ. So I think um, it takes time to bring people to wholeness. We, we yeah. don't learn that quickly. And if I got stuck in a Chinese finger trap and I keep trying to pull my fingers loose from that, that toy that I got at the amusement park, the harder I try, the tighter mm -hmm. that bamboo gets. And I've got to put my fingers together so that I loosen the tension and then just get out of it. But that that's easier said than done. And yeah. that took me three and a half years to unlearn mm -hmm. because I was so determined that I was going to beat this thing, mm -hmm. that that was getting in the way of actually beating it. And, and we do get in the way, even for others, uh, not just ourselves, but yeah. when we are operating in that, that quick answer that throw a scripture at it, we're not operating in compassion. First of no. all, we're not listening. We're not being present with them in their pain. We're not covering them in yeah. that moment. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you, you talked about the, you know, your thoughts, either uh, how we, we have thoughts or our thoughts have us. And I think if we can begin to understand that this doesn't, we, we shouldn't be condemning or shaming people who are dealing with being bound by their thoughts. I mean, you know, you talked about how you're an introspective and, and, and analytical and I'm the same way. And, and there have been times in my own life when I have just been, uh, spiraling in rumination over offenses or woundings being victimized. And, you know, that wants to keep you trapped in a victim mindset or in defeat and despair and hopelessness. And it's part of the problem that we've, that even in the ministry, we've become more concerned and self-absorbed with our agendas than with the broken and with the oppressed. No, I no, I think that is one of the ch challenges, particularly in the American evangelical culture. We don't realize how little our Christianity resembles the ancient faith. We're Americans. We're individualistic. And I don't think we realize how much our own biases have redefined Christianity from an individualistic perspective that the early church fathers would comment uh, and say things to us that we're not prepared to hear right now, which is why I think people are finding themselves without solutions and people are disillusioned with the kind of presentations of the gospel that aren't speaking to their deepest pain. Mm -hmm. The cross, first and foremost, is therapeutic. It is not juridical. Now, there is judgment. But what we do with the judgment of God in neo-evangelical neo circles is a far cry from the way the early church and the early fathers and mothers understood the cross. Christ is a healer. Christ is a lover. Christ is a caregiver. Christ is our elder brother. Christ bore what he bore so that we could be healed. Mm. And it's not a formula. It is a relationship. Mm -hmm. And 
I can give you the overview of church history, how we got there, but it would take us a little bit off course from the topic at hand. Suffice it to say that the early fathers in the first 300 years of church history saw the cross as that which heals the disease of sin. Mm. They didn't see it juridically in terms of judgmentalism. They saw sin as a disease. And I've got the receipts to back that up because I can already hear the opponents that are listening. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know they're there. I am, I am not, <laughs> I'm not, and I'll just say that the neo-Calvinists and I don't share a lot mm-hmm. of common ground theologically uh, for many reasons. And that doesn't mean I don't respect John Calvin, but neo-Calvinism has yeah. done great disservice to the nature and the person of Christ. Um, and so um, I think there are many areas where we have lost the fact that Jesus is lover first, not judge first. Yeah. Perfect love drives out all fear. And we need to recover that in the current mm-hmm. culture. And we've got Gen Zers leaving by the droves. They're disillusioned mm-hmm. because they see us as judgmental and not loving. Right. And, um, and you've got the disillusioned amongst the baby boomers that are not wanting to go back to church. I mean, this is, and this is a particularly um, contemporary problem. And it's because of, as you said, what we've done to the church to mm-hmm. assume that we have the right to play with what we think ecclesiology is about. And we have walked far from what what the church was intended to be in Christ. And we need to rebuild the walls and rehang the gates and repair the breach. Mm -hmm. So reformation needs to take place in the church. We're talking about reformation in the culture when the church itself is needing reforming. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of denial that we are living in a post-Christian era you know, we're spinning on our heads right now, having to relearn really who we are. Who are we in times of suffering? Who are we to the broken? Um, and how, you know, my heart, I just have to say my heart is really heavy and broken over Mm -hmm. this because this is the whole the whole personhood of Christ is embodied in, in compassion, in love, in reaching out to the oppressed. Uh, but we've walked away from true discernment. Uh, and, and maybe, uh, you know, as I read the book, maybe part of that is that we're fragmented within ourselves and we're keeping all these balls in the air and trying to project this success of, and, and the, the picture of success in, in our Christian faith and in our ministries and in our families. And yet there's a deeper need than we're even giving, uh, acknowledgement to within ourselves. And so how can we, uh, not be fragmented in our relationships or with the rest of the world. How can anyone relate to us if we are not understanding the language of their pain and the context of it? Yeah. And so for example, um, if we just look at anxiety in the current culture, and this includes the church, if this was 1965, according to Dr. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, a cognitive psychologist, if this were 1965, the average person diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, which means you have for six months sustained some level of consistent anxiety that just you live with it, Mm. that would have been an average uh, amongst males that were involved at a level of business and were 55 years or over dealing with business stress. Today, according to that same cognitive therapist, and these have been verified by data, that that same generalized anxiety disorder is the norm for a 14-year-old high school student. Oh. That's how much the information age has accelerated our stress. We don't know what to do with all the information we're bombarded with. and. Social media hasn't helped us. It's actually hurt us in that regard. And Mm. so 
there's a profound destabilizing of not only our personal psyche, but our collective psyche. And so anxiety is at an all time high and it has intensified. And at one time, while it was limited to um, just a few men, men and women now at, and the level of pain meds and prescription meds has increased by about 75% in the last 20 years. And even within that, the spike since COVID and the way people have had to process isolation and the reality that even coming out of that, people are still feeling like they're in a fog. They're battling with uncertainty. And whenever you battle uncertainty, anxiety always rises in the yeah. psyche. And because we're talking about um, the body of Christ, as if it's immune from these things, simply by quoting, be anxious for nothing, and, and failing to realize that both figures that say, be anxious for nothing, both Jesus, God in the flesh, and Paul, both of them went through severe traumatic experience that was anxious producing. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is so overwhelmed by the anxiety that his blood pressure causes his blood vessels at the capillary level to the surface of the skin to burst. He begins to redeem us in that suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's feeling that anxiety. And Luke describes those words in the Greek. He collapses under the weight of that panic. He's not running away from it. He's absorbing it. Mm -hmm. And then Paul is writing to the Corinthians and says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. When he writes 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, he said, I despaired so much. He said that I despaired even of life, that the sentence of death was passed in me, that I shouldn't trust myself, but in God. He wanted to die. I can relate to both extremes of that reality um, in a way that I never would have understood had I not gone through that dark season. Wow. Well, I wish we had more time because this is a, such an important subject. And Mark, this is an amazing book. Thank I want to thank you personally for writing it. I know it wasn't written just for me, but um, it sure is making an impact. And uh, I just want to say, Lord, help us. I know that he will. And he is faithful and he loves us all. And uh, it's a new frontier and I'm, I appreciate ministries like yours. And uh, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. And friends, I know that um, this is an important topic to you because I know that you are dealing with anxieties and stressors that are taking your health. They're robbing you of joy. And so this is why we have programs like this, because we want you to be encouraged. And I encourage you to find Mark's book and give it a good read and take your time reading it because you matter and the Lord loves you and he has a purpose for your life. Join me again next time. I'm Brenda Crouch.